Hello and welcome to the historynetwork.org podcast. This episode is brought to you by harrys.com and we've a great offer from them for you coming up later in the show. Now, if you're new to us, you may not know that we produce a number of other history-related podcasts as well. Angus, the other half at the History Network here, does his own podcast dedicated to World War II. Angus continues to produce two episodes monthly, and it's an eclectic mix of Second World War-related topics. MacArthur was a notable episode, and his recent episode on the PBY Catalina flying boat is proving a popular one too, where Angus actually talks to a guy who owns a share in one and flies it. We also produce the podcast for Ancient Warfare magazine, so if ancient warfare is your thing, then why not have a listen along to that? And if wargaming is your thing, then we produce the Wargaming Soldiers and Strategy podcast, and in the latest episode, out Monday 3rd of October, the guys are looking at all things terrain. So you've plenty to keep your ears busy there, and all you need to do is head to www.thehistorynetwork.org and use the links there to access all these great podcasts. Incidentally, we've a nice big shiny donate button on the homepage at the site, and if you feel the urge, we would certainly welcome that most gratefully. Or if you want a bit more listening bang for your buck, then in the store at the website you can find our past seasons all packaged up as chaptered files for download. These seasons vary from between around two and a half hours to over five hours, and they are just two pounds each. Thanks for your continued support. The History Network.org podcast, Season 21, Episode 8, World War II Auxiliary Cruiser Cormoran. On the 3rd of December 1940, the German auxiliary cruiser Cormoran slipped out of Gottenhafen. She was the largest of the new wave of merchant raiders which had proved so successful in the First World War. Captained by Theodore Detmers at just 38, he was the youngest of the auxiliary cruiser captains. In his own opinion, too young. Officially, he didn't even hold high enough rank to captain such a ship, but over the next year they successfully sank 11 enemy merchantmen and sparred with the destroyer HMAS Sydney, a David and Goliath encounter, an encounter in which they triumphed. During the interwar years, the German naval high command, the OKM, maintained an active interest in commerce raiding. Funds had been covertly channelled into German shipping companies to allow some of their fleet to be put aside in times of war to be commandeered and equipped as armed raiders. As tensions mounted in the late 1930s, the Mobile Machungsplan outlined the activation of six Hilfskreuzers, auxiliary cruisers. These were not to be a standard design, so that they might stand out as a class of their own, but rather medium-sized freighters of a regular design. Such a nondescript ship could easily be converted and camouflaged to give the appearance of an existing ship. The idea was not to take on the Royal Navy head-on, but to slip into the seas and oceans, causing fear and havoc in the world's shipping lanes. The strength of these auxiliary cruisers was to be able to become invisible, to not stand out, to morph into another existing ship and fly its flag. The commander of such a ship needed guile and cunning. The ships retained a civilian appearance. Armament was hidden, cloaked by false sides and tarpaulin, which helped them blend into the ship. The six main guns were First World War era 15 centimetre guns which had been left over from the war, but these were far from obsolete, and with most crews able to deliver at least three to four rounds of sustained fire per minute, they were able to pour fire accurately onto their target. Gunners could take out an enemy bridge at three to four thousand yards with their opening salvo, but this is close range in naval warfare terms. At over eight thousand yards, their chances of hitting dropped dramatically. 
but it was not intended that they would be engaging the Allied navies in traditional ship-to-ship engagements. Such was the belief in these raiders they were second in line of priority, with the construction of the U-boat fleet being at the top. Cormoran slipped into the Atlantic disguised as the Vyacheslav Molotov from Leningrad. Skirting to the north of the British Isles and through the Straits of Denmark, she reached the Atlantic on the 13th of December. Forbidden from taking any action north of the 40th parallel, they headed south, once in the Atlantic, Detmer's reduced speed. The Cormoran was the largest of the auxiliary cruisers, and the newest when converted. She was armed with six 15-centimetre guns hidden behind false hull plates, which were fitted with counterweights and could quickly be dropped when needed. She was equipped with six torpedo tubes, two of which were underwater on each side of the ship. The only visible armament was a number of two-centimetre anti-aircraft guns, which would at the time have raised little suspicion from other shipping. She also carried two Arado float planes. No catapult was fitted, being out of place on a merchantman, so the planes had to be hoisted in and out of the hold when used, a far from perfect solution which resulted in the two planes being seldom used on the Cormoran. Ploughing south past the Azores, the weather got warmer, as Detmus writes their job apart from sinking as much enemy tonnage as possible, was to appear as often as possible where we were least expected, and in this way sow the seeds of alarm and confusion in the enemy's shipping lanes, thus compelling him to abandon the shortest and most convenient routes, and to use the longer and more circuitous routes instead. They had a year's worth of supplies to achieve such a mission. The diesel-electric motors had enough fuel for seven months under ordinary circumstances. The crew settled into a waiting game, looking for targets, not flying any flag to remain mysterious. The 6th of January they stopped and then scuttled the Greek freighter Antonis. The crew of 28 were taken on board the Cormoran. Due to the threat posed by commerce raiding from the auxiliary cruisers and U-boats, much shipping had been grouped into convoys for their own protection, but away from the main sea lanes, single ships could still be found. On the 18th of January, as evening was drawing in, a ship was sighted. In the darkness, the ship, a tanker, the British Union, sailed without illumination, a sure sign she was a belligerent enemy vessel. From four miles, Detmers fired star shells and straddled the tanker with the main guns. As she returned fire, the British Union managed to get out an RRR distress signal. The problem the Royal Navy had when trying to catch the auxiliary cruisers was finding them. Randomly sailing the seven seas was a dreadfully inefficient way to track them down. A series of signals had been developed that ships under attack could broadcast. This not only informed other shipping of their distress, but also told the Admiralty the location of an enemy ship. SSS signalled attack by submarines, while RRR warned of an attack by a surface raider. QQQ warned of an unknown raider. Later, all of these codes switched from three repeats of the letter to four repeats. The German Naval Warfare Command, SKL, picked up the signal and ordered the Cormoran out of the area. The threat being the British may have picked up the signal and ordered a search. She now headed to the Indian Ocean. Once they arrived in their zone of operation, they reduced speed to nine knots to conserve fuel. On these long journeys, crew morale was essential. In their off-duty hours, crew could swim in a pool which had been rigged up on deck. It was only five feet deep, and five or six strokes would take you from one end to the other. Every afternoon there was a film show with 120 men packed in like sardines. They didn't seem to mind the discomfort. Only one performance a day was given so as to maximise the supply of films. Throughout the spring and summer, Cormoran continued to sink enemy shipping, though it was increasingly difficult to find targets. British merchant ships stuck closer to the shore, where they could receive some protection from RAF patrol aircraft. The SKL became increasingly wary after the loss of HSK Penguin, 
Though Penguin had seriously damaged HMS Cornwall once out of range of Penguin's guns, Cornwall continued to successfully fire at her with the aid of walrus seaplanes acting as spotters for her guns. Relieved from duty in the Indian Ocean by HSK Thor, Cormoran resupplied and refitted at sea. Prisoners were taken off by the supply ship. Detmers now decided to lay his mines off Perth in Western Australia. They now had enough supplies to last them until June 1942, and if they got that far, they would have been at sea for nearly 18 months. Warned a convoy was about to leave Perth with the British cruisers Cornwall and Dorsetshire as escorts, Detmers decided to sail further north and mine Shark Bay, then proceed to the East Indies. Cormoran now went silent. The 24th of November, Berlin intercepted Sydney Radio asking for details of the action and the name of the ship from which survivors had come. Six days later, SKL learnt HMAS Sydney was missing and four days overdue from Fremantle. It was believed she had been sunk by a raider. The final intercept confirmed it. A British tanker has taken on board German seamen from a raft and others have been sighted in lifeboats, of which two have arrived in Western Australia. Apparently Sydney was on fire when last seen by Germans. With Cormoran, the only ship at sea in the vicinity at the time, SKL realised she had been lost. What had happened? Well, more on that after I tell you about our sponsor, Harry's Great New Deal. Regular listeners may remember that Harry's have sponsored a few episodes before, and we're delighted to have them back, and they've got a great new offer for you, our listeners. You know I've been using Harry's shaving products since we first hooked up with them, and I've never looked back or wanted to change who supplies my blades. For me, it's like some care and thought has actually gone into these products. The razor handle feels good in the hand, the blades don't get clogged, and I get a fantastic shave every time. And with one of Harry's plans, you can even get your blades delivered regularly to your door. What's even greater now is that Harry's are keeping their prices exactly the same. Harry's five-blade razors now include a softer flex hinge for a more comfortable glide, trimmer blade for hard-to-reach places, lubricating strip, and a textured handle for more control when it's wet. And they still work out at just $2 a blade, compared to four or more you'll pay at the drugstore. By owning the factory in Germany, where they make the blades, Harry's can produce these high-quality razors themselves and sell them online for half the price of competitors. So Harry's is so confident in the quality of their blades, they'll send you their popular free trial set, which comes with a razor, five-blade cartridge and shaving gel, free when you sign up for a shaving plan. Just pay shipping. Plus, there's a special offer for fans of this show. Enter the code HISTORY at checkout to get a post-shave balm added to your order absolutely free. So just go to harrys.com right now and enter the code HISTORY at checkout to claim your free trial set and post-shave balm. That's harrys.com checkout code HISTORY to receive these great free offers. Thanks so much. It was warm and sunny on the afternoon of the 19th of November when the lookout on the Cormoran spotted smoke to the northwest, setting the alarm bells ringing. By the time Detmers arrived on the bridge, it had become apparent the approaching vessel was the Australian Navy cruiser, the Sydney. The Sydney had been escorting troop ships and was now returning. The captain, Joseph Burnett, was aware a German raider had been in Australian waters but had no specific warning from HQ, and there had been no specific losses in the area to raise suspicion. Not expecting enemy shipping, he didn't even launch his walrus plane to investigate. The Sydney had a very experienced crew with an impressive war record. She had been in the Mediterranean from June 1940 to January 1941, sinking an Italian light cruiser and a destroyer, destroying a four-ship convoy. Captain Burnett was also no greenhorn. He had entered naval college at 13. At 17, he was sent to England to join the battle cruiser HMAS Australia. 
Throughout the interwar years, he steadily rose through the ranks, serving on both ship and shore. His last assignment had been on land, planning for the defence of the Pacific. The Sydney was his first wartime command at sea, though he was believed to be one of the most promising and exceptional officers in the Royal Australian Navy. Outgunned, Detmers quickly ordered the Cormoran to turn tail and increase speed to eighteen knots, sailing into the sun. Evasion was out of the question, and another three hours until dusk. Even that would be little help, as the nights were clear with good visibility. Detmers determined to hold his course and see how things unfolded. Meanwhile, Burnett on the Sydney was rapidly closing on the radar, closing on her starboard side. The main searchlight flashed NNJ, a request for the unknown ship to hoist your signal letters. There seems to have been some delay of up to thirty minutes, as Detmers claimed he didn't understand the request. Then, when they acknowledged, they only did so slowly. Finally, the Cormoran raised PKQ, identifying her as the Dutch ship Strat Malacca. All the time, the Sydney was drawing closer. Signalled to ask for a destination, Detmers took a stab in the dark and replied, Batavia. He was surprised that the Burnett hadn't asked him to heave to, which would have put him at a disadvantage as the Sydney drew closer, all of which would seem to indicate Burnett wasn't suspicious. At 9,000 metres, the Sydney was coming into range of the 15-centimetre guns of the Cormoran. Detmers could make out quite clearly that the 4-inch anti-aircraft guns weren't manned, though the 6-inch guns were all pointing straight at him. Still playing for time, when the Sydney inquired as to her cargo, the signalman on the Cormoran slowly responded, Peace goods, and hauled up the Dutch flag. To add further confusion, Detmers sent out a QQQ signal, which would indicate to anyone picking it up that an Allied ship had spotted a suspicious vessel. It was a ruse that the HSK Penguin had used a few months earlier when challenged by HMS Cornwall. The Penguin's captain, Cruder, was playing for time. At 10,000 metres, he opened fire. Though at extremely long range, her 15-centimetre guns had knocked out the Cornwall steering, forcing her to withdraw. Though once Cornwall had a grip of the situation, her 8-inch guns managed to land a salvo which sank the Penguin in seconds. Yet more time had elapsed, and the Sydney had closed to 1,300 metres on a parallel course. The Germans had now been at action stations for over an hour. At that range, the Australian crew could be seen lining the upper rails of the Sydney, smoking and watching the proceedings. At 17.30, Detmers ordered the camouflage to be dropped and the gum flaps come down as the Kriegsmarine flag went up. Within six seconds of the order being given, the Germans opened fire. In moments, the bridge on the Sydney was being pummeled by 37mm high-explosive rounds. The 20mm anti-aircraft guns swept the decks. The director control tower, which provided fire control, was hit. Seconds ticked by as the Germans pumped shells into the Sydney. Finally, all four of the Sydney's tunnels fired in unison. But as Cormoran had moved since she was targeted, just a single round hit her, passing through the funnel. Sydney's guns fell silent, awaiting orders from the now shattered control tower. Cormoran fired everything they had. One torpedo struck the bow, knocking a turret out of action. The bridge crew were gone, and the fire control unable to give target ranges, crews had to switch to local control. Range finding was usually done by firing a spotted round and then correcting, a time-consuming procedure not helped as the Cormoran's crew were firing upwards of five rounds a minute of her 15-centimetre guns into the Sydney. Such was their rate of fire, at one point the Germans were forced to pause and let the guns cool. Finally, the gunners on the Sydney started to return fire. Two six-inch rounds hit the Cormoran's engine room, killing most of the engineers and starting a serious fire. Detmers lost contact with the engine room and the Cormoran started to lose power. With both ships on fire and badly damaged, they started to drift apart. Once 10,000 metres apart, Detmers ordered his crew to cease fire. The Cormoran was fatally wounded, her engines had gone, and with the loss of the firefighting equipment in the engine room, there was no hope of putting out the fires that raged. 
Detmers now readied his crew to abandon ship. 317 of the surviving crew of the Cormoran took to the lifeboats, and the now blazing ship was scuttled with the use of charges. Little is known of what happened to the Sydney. The crew of the Cormoran reported being able to see her drift away, and once darkness fell, her glow could be seen in the night. At some point she must have suffered a catastrophic structural failure, and sank very quickly with the loss of all hands. No trace of her was found at the time. It was the largest warship during the war to be lost with no survivors. All we know of the dramatic confrontation is from the German sailors from the Cormoran that were picked up a few days later. They spent the rest of the war as POWs in Australia. The action was an example where the deception and skill of the German crews paid off. Undoubtedly they were aided by Captain Burnett's decision to close to such a short range with an unidentified ship. The German auxiliary cruisers during the Second World War were remarkably successful. In the first 20 months between April 1940 and November 1941, the first seven cruisers operating sank or captured 97 vessels over 650,000 tonnes. The Royal Navy struggled to deal with the threat. Compare that to the regular German surface fleet, which sank just 58 vessels, some 300,000 tonnes. They also managed to disrupt trade in quieter waters of the world. Valuable resources had to be put aside to convoy merchant shipping in areas such as the Indian Ocean. The tide only turned once the British started to decode German signals and long-range maritime aircraft patrolled shipping lanes. Crucially, they also targeted the German supply vessels, vital to keeping the cruisers operational. By December 1941, not a single German auxiliary cruiser was operational at sea. The British had stationed cruisers in and around the Straits of Denmark equipped with radar, effectively bottling in the next wave of cruisers unless they ran the gauntlet through the English Channel, an achievement which HSK Thor did manage, and others followed, but they never achieved the same success as those in the first wave at the start of the war. Don't forget to help yourself to that great offer from Harry's, our sponsor today, by heading over to harrys.com and using the code HISTORY at checkout. You'll really be helping us out by doing so. You can also find us on social media, and we'd love it if you'd like our Facebook page. Just search for The History Network on Facebook and come and join in the conversation on there. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the historynetwork.org podcast, written by Angus Wallace, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>